Hi, everybody. Welcome to Professional Practice for Graphic Design and Portfolio Capstone, a tale of two courses. And uh, just so you know, my name is Nikki Arnell. I'm coming from you virtually, but I'm up near the Mississippi River in the uh, Memphis, Tennessee, about an hour away from where I teach at Arkansas State University. All right, let's get going. Okay. Make this a little bit smaller. Yay, Zoom. Okay. All right. So as the abstract stated, I mean, explained a lot, but really the main thing is that many colleges insist on stuffing all elements taught in these courses into one semester long course. It is impossible. Really, it is. So I'm going to give, explain the way that I've done it. And this is what we'll be talking about today. Let's start with the overview and uh, what I what the degree is that my students are obtaining. So it's a BFA, Bachelor of Fine Arts in Graphic Design. So that just uh, it's just a more of their classes are going to be in the arts. Uh, that also means they have a ton of three hour long studios. So if we can get them out in four years, which we try, maybe a summer thrown in there, then uh, it can be done with other degrees. So just a general idea of what our coursework is. On the left side, that's general education. On the right is what they must take. So a lot more uh, traditional art courses. Down at the very, very bottom is the co-requisite of the capstone of portfolio, which goes in line with professional practice. All right, and a couple of challenges just to let you guys know how I handle that with this particular talk. If there is a challenge, that little icon is gonna show up. And almost all of them have solutions. So for example, an easy, well, one that you've all had to deal with is COVID um, and things like, uh, it was already practically a hybrid, hybrid course anyway. Slack, Google Drive, you could use Dropbox. Uh, I use a lot of Google um, and Adobe Creative Cloud. My students had it on campus after COVID. They have access to Creative Cloud off campus. We use a lot more Zoom and Blackboard. For archived lectures. Okay, so professional practice, let's jump right on into it. First of all, you'll notice that that was broken up into sections and an overarching job hunt journal. And this is something that I think after working on this, these courses for about a decade is absolutely necessary. Break it up into smaller sections, even though within that there are multiple projects and the projects even overlap as you can see here. But that way you have four schedules and not 17 plus. It's too much otherwise. So, and I make all of these as interactive PDFs. And so there's multiple projects within the sections, but it really, really helps me, helps the students. It's good. I mean, let's be honest though, it's supposed to be an overwhelming class. But I need to give them a string of hope. <laughs> also, as you'll see, even though those are broken up, most of the things start to inform each other. And it's this kind of organic ball of awesome that it starts to develop until they, until they think they can't, they could never make it through. And at the end of the semester, they do it. And it's amazing. And they know they can do it. All right, so just a little bit about the job hunt journal. Uh, first of all, the job hunt journal, it, it requires them to look into three cities and find places for their employment. Now, a challenge is a student might say, but I want to freelance. So is the class for freelancing or to work for a shop? So I'm asking them to research shops. And as this great article from AIGA has said, you need experience somewhere, anywhere. And one of the best places to find that is an agency. So work a little there, find out, get your connections, and then maybe go freelance if you even want to. So I think it's really important that students understand that. Um, because they will also be developing a brand for themselves that they can get a job at an agency and or go freelance. So they, they learn both skills. And the job hunt journal, they need to research all of those things. And I know I'm flashing this stuff at you guys, but all of this is going to be available on a website that you can get to at the end of this uh, lecture, talk. Um, they need to research that. And then in the future, now they aren't actually using this in this class for anything other than when they want to write their cover letter. In theory, who would they write it to? But they need to know that when they get out, the best jobs aren't gonna be found on classifieds or something. They need to get to, and they need to get to the, 
the good one, the creative director. And that's not often, you can't find that very easily. So I'll teach them how to do some detective work. It used to be that they had to go to some library and find the red book or be in a business in a city large enough to have a business journal to have the, the top 10 list and find the top biggest agencies. And it's kind of hard to do. And luckily it's easier now. You just gotta go on LinkedIn and know how to Google. And also there are lots of other places. So I, I teach them how to find these places. And then uh, once they have their three cities, five companies, they also need to make a communications journal because that's how they network. And it used to be something that was done printed. Now it's all done thanks to COVID precautions, interactive PDF. And really it's a better way to do it anyway. They're gonna use a printed piece. If they really like to write stuff, they can print it out and use it. But they also get to use, learn how to do this easy interactive PDF in InDesign. Really easy to do that. All right, so that's kind of a side thing. Let's talk about the sections. <coughs> Excuse me. So section one, really it's done in the first couple of weeks. It's the easiest section and it gets them their head around what a brand is. And they get, and remember they've, they're in a class of about 20 students uh, capped at 25 and they've all worked with each other before. So they're also, they're used to speaking with each other even though in COVID land that's all on Slack or on Zoom. They're used to it by now. So first of all, and this is a challenge for the world, everyone thinks a brand is a logo and it's not, but I think I'm probably preaching to the choir if you're watching this video. So they learn that before they ever get to the logo, they need to start figuring out what a brand is. Also, it's something that as they develop this brand about themselves, it, it becomes armor for them because they're going into a field where their creativity is for hire. And they need to learn that that is not themselves. It is, but they, otherwise they're going to, they're going to burn out. If every time a client says that's wrong, they're not going to be in the business for long. So we do a lot of workshops and this is like fun and exciting as they're getting into it. Remember, they're also starting portfolio class, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, they do things like, you know, comparison game, cocktail party, just little things like that. They also do a brand positioning statement, which is very awkward and it doesn't make sense to them because most of them, only a fraction of my students have a marketing minor and uh, it's, they got to start somewhere though. Again, it starts to learn, they, they start to learn how to make their brand, their brand that is them, but separate from themselves. However, they do still do a personal mission statement, which is just a sort of reflection on their strengths and stuff like that. Because it says right there, um, who you are should definitely inform your brand or else it will be too much of a manufactured self and have no longevity. And really for a lot of what this class is, I want this to be about, they're learning how to create something so that when they're done, they can use it as soon as they graduate or at least have the skills to refine and make exactly what they want to be. They can also apply all of this stuff to any businesses that they are doing brand work for. Uh, they do brand and logo research and they talk about like best, worst, best brand, best logo. So they start to see how they are not necessarily the same thing. Also, they learn strong brand presence on socials. This is important because way in the future in section four, they're going to do that. That's far into the future. Always good to see the way you're going to end up. All right. They also do a little bit of business plan A, which is just a matter of things like SWOT analysis of so marketing terms and just, you know, what is your future? Where do you see yourself? You know, just starting to be aware of the dream because if they can help it, they should get out of their little college town that is a saturated market of designers. Where else could they go? And that's going to also be informed by their job hunt journal. And uh, so that's there. And then also their idea board. <laughs> There's the cost, the, the challenge. I thought this was an art class. Now, granted, they are starting to work on their portfolio. Remember, lots of art there. But it's just a nice, it's starting, it's not a brand board. It's not quite a mood board. It's just getting an idea of what do you, what do you like, your type and stuff. And that's going to start to inform their logo, which is just around the corner. And I make sure they know that it could be that they make these boards and nothing in the future comes back to it. They just need to start somewhere. All right, and we start, so section one is done pretty quickly. It's an oddball as we sort of, I don't scare them. Also portfolio is starting full force as the other class. So section two begins. Now, honestly, 
honestly, section two is logo and other stuff. The other stuff, it's a big deal, but I mean, the website's a big deal, but it's really gonna go hand in hand with portfolio and go on throughout the course. Logo is the big one. Now, logo is gonna, in, it's gonna start to work hand in hand with visual identity. But as you can see right there, section two is gonna start almost as soon as, sorry, section three is going to start almost as soon as section two does. But that's really visual identity informing logo and stuff like that. So as it says, right, oh, and also they're gonna to start to be aware when they, because they don't know what to call themselves. They could call themselves their name, which is great. They could call themselves something like a company where they are the main person. They have a lot of different um, freedom. And of course, freedom can be stifling for them. So along with the website and budget projects coming around the corner, what's, what domain name is available? And an email, they aren't gonna use their A-state emails anymore. Um, and you know what about Instagram? That's going to be needed at the end of the semester. So start figuring out what usernames are available and claim them. And that's going to help inform. And I, ex I expect you know they know logo. The, this project is huge. It will inform almost every project after it. So they need to have some proper respect. They've all done logos um, before. This isn't the first time. Uh, they're not great at them yet, not necessarily. Logos are hard. There's a reason why people pay a lot of money for them. So we also, as you will see, have many, 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 many rounds. And again, it starts to go hand in hand with your visual, with visual identity almost immediately. But they do research logo type and marks. Um, many of them are gonna end up with logo type. And so they need to be aware of that. Sometimes some of my students have only uh, done more work with marks. So lots of rounds of sketches, and then they have to color in different color versions and by hand, whether that's Procreate Fresco on an iPad or on paper, I want them to do it more slowly. I want them to really get into the details of it. Um, and then eventually they, uh, they get into vector and they need to be able to have it live in grayscale and in color. It needs to live in reverse, so on black and on white, and it needs to work in an inch by an inch, always the best way to test to make sure that logo is really as simple as it can be. And then I have them put them on mockups just because it's fun, just because I want them to see it alive. It's pretty fun. Now, visual identity is not gonna, those mockups are gonna be handled in visual identity in section three, which remember is gonna be starting almost as soon as logo, but let's finish out the rest of section two real quick. So websites, that's going to be going hand in hand with portfolio. Even though their portfolio, they're going to make one linear read of a portfolio. I mean, anything that's going to go online is going to also be in that portfolio, a couple extras. So now they need to do a personal site. And of course, and they can do something that is a CMS like Wix, where it's pretty much a template that they can refine. Totally fine with that. They all on their resumes know HTML and CSS. They are aware of it. They've been taught that in their classes. Now, if someone is going to say that they know a lot of other coding and that's what one of their skills are, and there are a couple in my classes that do that, most of them don't. But if they're gonna say that, then they need to code their own site. Most of them, I'm fine with them using a CMS. And as you will see though, that we're gonna talk about with budget in just a second about domain names, whether it's a free site or they have to pay for the domain. But also they have to do Behance. The social media, one of the best social medias of portfolio sites. And of course they connect on Behance, you put your regular site, everything connects. Um, Behance is owned by Adobe. It's got a lot of power behind it. So, and it's free for them. So uh, with that domain, as I mentioned, this is gonna tie in with the budget project also under section two, which I'll mention in a second. I used to, first of all, I don't want any websites that have ads all over them. I used to make them pay for a domain, but then what would happen is they would also pay for their business cards to be printed with that domain. And within a year, it would be worthless because they wouldn't be paying for their website anymore. So whatever it takes for them to be able to keep that domain, okay, fine. Like for example, um, uh, portfolio.com added at the end, easy, but that has to do with Adobe, there it is on the bottom. But that means you have to be paying for Adobe Creative Suite. Will they be able to be doing that after they are done with their classes here at A-State? Hopefully, but maybe not. Um, so there are some different options they need to research that. 
which is part of that's pretty much their budget. They need to research. It used to require more, as it said right there, stickers, rubber stamps, merchandise, all sorts of stuff, mailing material. COVID precautions stopped that last year, and I've continued that this year. Also realizing I'm finally starting to listen to when students complain that they don't have enough money for it. I hear you. I hear you. Thanks, COVID. <laughs> I hear I finally had to stop and listen and realize students didn't need, they really didn't need to have letterhead printed anymore. Really, they don't. They do still need to have business cards. They, they need to be nice business cards. They need to be shipped. So that is still required. And they need to do the research on the domain. As I was mentioning, they need to, if they, if they can't pay for it, okay, but have a good, a good not million letter length URL. So for example, I want a year from now, this was a student last year, that was their business card, the backside of their business card, and it had jodykelsostudio.com. Cool, you know what? I bring it up, the site is still live. Great, but I don't want is something like this. And this makes me sad because this particular student, she's so talented, by the way, she's children's book illustration, amazing. She's gonna do great things one day, but she hasn't been able to find employment COVID right after graduation. So she hasn't been able to pay for her domain. So right now all those business cards that she had produced go to a dead site and that's sad. Um, so I also didn't demand Behance then, another reason to demand Behance. So between those two things, I want their business cards that they print to not be a waste of money. All right, uh, also within here, but again, budget, websites, some research and they get started. Logo's the big one. References also, not really that big of a project now. And the challenge there in the corner, I used to wait until resumes on section three as like this afterthought, forgetting that students have, most students have never done this before, certainly not for design references. So it's a really pretty quick project that we bring up again in resume, but the project technically closes with section two. So I only demand three references and they need to do things like the usual first and last name, job title. Now that part in italics there, what you think they would say about you and why they are a strong reference. That's only for me for this reference project. When we bring this up again, it's blocked by my thing at the bottom there, but additional page of information, that's gonna be when we do resume, it'll be put on their visual identity letterhead that'll be done that goes with their resume page, but not on their resume page. And they'll leave off that thing about what you think they would say. So that's gonna come back up. But they also need to know there's that challenge. They have no idea where to get them. I know that all they hear is you can't call up your mom. So how are they gonna find these references? Really, really, you have to tell them where to do it. You probably know that. I do not allow any more than two professors to be references and I really don't want many. I am not a reference for them. Um, I will be after the class as addition to, in addition to their three. But for this class, I won't be it, it's too easy. Now, one thing there on the bottom, sometimes international students have specific challenges. So for example, this semester, I have a student from China and one from Korea, and um, actually they ended up both being okay and not needing all professors, but many times some students, because they have had uh, certain legal regulations and things where they, they haven't had as much luck being able to find other references. Sometimes I've allowed more professors for them. All right. Then we go on to section three. Honestly, section three is the big one. It's the bear. And remember that starts with visual identity as almost as soon as logo starts because they inform each other. And visual guidelines are informed by this, even though really visual guidelines don't really get started until cover letter is started, which uses the letterhead, which uses the logo. So as I'm recording this, this presentation right now, we are right in the middle of all of that. And it's, I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for about a decade and it's really important to tell students like one informs the other informs the other. Eventually I have to say a logo is due, but many of them are still refining and making them perfect. So visual identity starts. Um, they only do business cards, letterhead and envelope is now extra credit because hello, it's the 21st century. All right, I'm gonna get back to that. I also remind them, and you probably know, design the business card first. It's the most difficult because it's designing the most in a small amount of space. Uh, letterhead is an echo of that. 
So, and we do lots of sketches. So as you can see, this is for visual identity. She's still trying to figure out what her logo is. Um, she doesn't have any envelopes on here. Also, I remind them because they, if they haven't done letterhead before, they've done logos, but they haven't done letterhead. They have never used, many of them have never used it. They have no idea what I'm talking about. And for me to say a letter is going to go on here, they see this blank white piece of page and they, they just keep trying to fill the space. So I, I often suggest put a letter on there, even if it's just lorem ipsum, Greek stuff, like Greeking. I know that's not Greek. <laughs> um, fill, this, fill it so you understand what the letter is supposed to be used for. Um, here's another student. Obviously, she's doing a lot more with her logo set, but she's trying to figure out her colors. And obviously, she doesn't understand how envelopes work. That's okay. She's just trying to figure stuff out. Um, now, I also let them know what is required, important. And, you know, the two by three and a half or three and a half by two for business cards. And they, they need to know why. Uh, and double-sided, you know, optional, that goes with their budget. If you're gonna design a double-sided, you better make sure you can pay for it. Um, there are half size. There's also the square size, but make sure, I make sure they know if you're gonna do a square size, then when someone puts it in any kind of business card holder, it's gonna be bent, you know, things like that. But information required, and by the way, this is really important in case you haven't, haven't thought about this when, when doing this class, no addresses, really, really not suggested to put an address on a business card or as you will find a letterhead. Just don't. First of all, it's, it doesn't require, they're not gonna be living in a dorm or on campus in Jonesboro, I hope not. I mean, so that's not gonna make much sense to put on a card. It's also not often on a card anymore, unless you have a brick and mortar shop. And for safety, nobody needs to be stopped. So just, don't put an address on there. The socials and stuff like that. Also, by the way, in section four, they do a virtual business card, but so they will have both, all the different, different versions here. Um, and on letterhead, oh, and by the way, on a business card, uh, no pictures, no pictures of people. Um, also not on the letterhead. Uh, and as you will find when I explain resumes, we do not, we do a resume for America. And so therefore they should not have their picture on it. Mm -mm. Okay. So uh, business card, letterhead, logo, website, socials, and extra credit envelope. They don't, honestly, most don't even know how an envelope works. And I'm talking students from America. They don't know how it works. And it's really not used anymore and it costs money. But if they do want to do it, I do remind them they can put a return address on the back closing flap if they'd like. All right, visual guidelines. It says logo, visual identity, and the final cover letter all inform visual guidelines. So it starts early, but it goes on for a long time. Cover letter is what really starts to inform it. Um, so it says right there. And many of them have never actually used visual guidelines. So they, they keep trying to explain things like, um, uh, and there's, there's a lot of examples there, including students from last year. Uh, they, they keep trying to figure out how to explain their design process. And that's not it. Like I keep trying to explain to them, someone has received your letterhead printed already. How do you want them to use it? You want them to use 14 point Comic Sans? No, of course not. You know, so it's, it's a matter of explaining how to use everything and including the email sign off and how to make one of those. That's where that comes in. So it says, students get very confused, explain exactly what this is for. And of course I could explain all day, but that's why I give them samples to show them. Okay, cover letter. So I'm gonna skip resume for a second and jump on to cover letter. Here's a big thing. I used to try to have them write it from scratch. Oh my God, just don't, just don't, don't. Give them a template and also give them a cover letter outline to begin with, which is pretty much, so it says right there where you've got some bullet points about highlights. Now they take a job and a, and a target that they've gotten from their job hunt journal and they're as if they were writing to that, not really. And then in the outline, they've got those like, how could I match my skills to that? They do six on the outline. So when they put it in their template, they ju they're just refining things. Oh my gosh, you, you need to do this or else your life will be a living hell. All right. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the whole never have them write to whom it may concern. 
use the job hunt journal. I'll also remind them that Mrs. and Miss, it's the 21st century and a woman's marital status has, it doesn't matter. So don't put it on there. You guys know that, make sure students are surprised. Ms. or of course, doctor, of course, if either gender has doctor that outrides it. Um, you know, little things like closing the letter by signing your name, but they have to, have to, have to have perfect grammar and perfect uh, spelling. And that's where the job hunt journal is used. That's where they would say, well, I sent out this tangible letter or an email and they keep track of it. So I explain how they need to do that for networking and when you will contact them and then you would call them. By the way, I use something called Goodreader on my iPad and that's how I mark everything up. Don't try and do things for printing. Even before COVID precautions, I did that. It's a really, really good app. All right. And then resume. So I make sure as it says right there, designer res designer's resume is different than average, but is not the place for kooky and conceptual. Because as soon as they try to Google that, there will be. Also, as soon as students Google it, there will be pictures on resumes. And again, not in America. Do not allow students to put their picture on a resume in America or Ireland or the UK. But there are other countries, as probably some of you are watching, and I have told my students who are from, like, for example, China, uh, according to my, my research, it is expected to have a picture on your resume. Um, I let, the, I let uh, for example, my student this year know that, but that I am having them create a resume for America, but that they, so that they can go out if they go back to their home country to realize that that would change slightly. All right. Um, they start with a preliminary resume form. Please have your students do this before they jump into a resume. Uh, things like um, explaining what an objective that's not necessarily required. This is right there. If there's an asterisk, it's required. And they need to do this in InDesign for future. Don't let them do it in Illustrator. Um, explain how to word their education. Be very, very clear about how to word the degree. Um, remind them that everything is in reverse chronological order. Professional experience. This is a big thing about that workshop that I was saying. Dig up all the possibilities to be worded as professional experience. Anything. You can go through and edit. Um, but that, that's where the designer's resume is going to be different. I mean, it's really great if they've done, if they've held a retail job and no customer service, especially if they've been a manager. But what about things like an internship? What about things that they did in a class that was really for a client? Um, you know, really, really dig up everything because we want to make them look like they've had about a year or two of experience coming out of school. Don't have them, don't give them just, I did this in class or like really, really find, find the things that are, have anything to do with design. And of course, reminding them visual hierarchy so that, you know, and having a design system that pops. That is the other thing about a resume for a designer, of course, it has to have perfect typography and show, show branding of their logo. Also, uh, service. If any of you haven't written a resume in a while, service is pretty much required now. Thanks millennials, thanks Gen Z, you guys are awesome. And service is increasingly important to show on your resumes now. So finding that. Uh, in fact, that's where many, if a student is in a sorority or fraternity, they've often done service. Um, in being in the Mississippi Delta, many students are part of a church or other religious, many times it's a church in this part of the country. And they've done, if they've done any kind of service or any kind of fundraising, anything like that. Now, if they're on AIGA or AdFed, these are two design slash advertising groups in this country where they have student groups. Um, those could be under organizations. All right, um, awards, definitely. Scholarships could be listed here or under education, juried art exhibition, if they've won Addies, anything like that. Skills, any kind of skills, and depending on software should be listed when they're first out of class, out of school, but that could be listed with skill or separate, depending. Um, just like depending on how much, if they haven't done a lot of stuff and they have a lot of room on their resume, their one page resume, sometimes they need to list all of the software they know. If they've got a lot of experience, um, maybe they just list Adobe Creative Suite. But you know, things like they all know HTML, CSS, even if they don't code, they know enough about code to know that. Many of them also know UI UX because uh, some of them have done full out prototyping, but they all understand user experience. 
all of them. All right, and interface. Uh, references, we do references as a separate page. They are not allowed to put it on the same page as their resume. It just as available upon request. So here are some examples, like here. I mean, this is a student who's just graduating college, but I mean, he's done that much experience. Do you see what I mean? Make them look as, I mean, really find all the places where uh, they've had design experience. Here's another one. She's done a lot of service. Every once in a while you get a student who's got enough writing skills and creativity that they're willing to pull their brand all the way through. This was really risky. She's gonna be okay, she can do it. All right, uh, this is for a student who is an international student from Saudi Arabia. So she's got, um, she's done a great job of having other kinds of service and uh, she brings an experience she's had in Jonesboro and elsewhere. Obviously one important, hugely important skill fluent in multiple languages. By the way, she just wrote me, she's back in her home country, already has a job. And this is where we have the references come back from section two, where you just list it on your letterhead, it's all done by now. Um, and you list, you know, things like just, you can have an explanation. Um, you don't say what the person would say about them, but how you know, how they know the person. All right, and then brand board. Again, it's just, it's taken, it's like their idea board grew up. They already have, they have a template, they fill it in, it's more professional. So in their brand book at the end of this class, they have, uh, they don't include their idea board, they include their brand board. Stuff like this and this and this. All right, and we are in section four. And so financial forms, that is because they've also had things, they had a talk from me about the confidence strut, just which goes in line with at the end of the semester, they will have it specifically about interviewing, but it's learning about having a presence, really having confidence. Some of them need it, some of them don't, but most of them do. And a fellow professor who also freelance or has, I mean, she has her own, her own design business, everything. I talk on, you know, don't get screwed. How, I talk on how to be a business guru, which lines up with those financial forms I just talked about. So, once they learn that, it's things like um, hourly estimate, and this is all on the branded stuff, going with their visual identity, hourly estimate, estimate or a project quote, and then how to invoice both. So they have those ready to go. Now, of course, they need to learn how much they would charge an hour, and that goes with business plan B. They've done their research, but also not just some random number grabbed from the clouds. If you, if you, this is more about, if you, I mean, especially if you're going to do a freelance thing, but in general, it also reminds them if you're going to do freelance, how much for healthcare in this country? Um, you know, really, truly understanding the cost of these things. All right, and here's the big star, the big star of section four, like logo is the big star of section two, social media. Uh, so that goes in some steps. Now they need to have a presence on LinkedIn, which isn't, doesn't require a lot of content creation for them. Um, but, and of course, many of them are like LinkedIn, that's, for, that's not for artists. Uh, yeah, it is. So many people get jobs there, as you probably all know. And Instagram, I used to demand things like Twitter and stuff like that. That's just not where they are. They can be on it if they want to. I've never suggested they be on Facebook, but um, they can be if they want to as a, as a business. I demand Instagram. And then they need to create a uh, a weekly plan. So this in a content calendar, social media content creation. And they put this in their brand book so people see they understand what this is. Also, I want them to understand they need to have a, a constant presence on their social media. And of course, it's very hard to do. So they learn how to use Hootsuite. It's a dashboard for scheduling. And they show me how that they know how to do that. And it's free to schedule their posts on um, for what I need for the very few platforms and only 10 days straight. And they show me they can do it. Content creation. There's another one of an example of one of my students and being aware of how it all looks on their Instagram page. Big one. All right, the interactive PDFs, not a big deal. They just pretty much take everything that's been done from section three and they make it interactive. Now that they know for sure, they have social media that's live, their website is live, everything is live. So make it so that when it's, um, if when it's the, I mean, there's the paper version, then there's 21st century where something is uh, in a PDF form and interactive, very easy to do in InDesign. And then they get to the final and that goes into their brand book. 
it's pretty much like, so there's their visual guidelines that they did earlier. Now let's add everything else after it. So, and it's creative as an interactive PDF and or they could do an Adobe Spark page. So whichever one they want to do. And um, so brandedshow.com, and I'll have this again at the end of the, the, the talk today, you can go easily go there, pull it out to the student and go to brand book and you can see all that they've done. Also everything else they've done. All right. Also towards the end of the semester there, the, the two classes start to go hand in hand. They get a lecture slash workshop about how to interview both face to face um, on, a, on the phone. And now thanks to 2020 and 2021 on Zoom. All right, in fact, their final interview, we're gonna talk about what we've done this year compared to the past years. Um, their, final, that, their final is an interview on Zoom with professors. All right, let's talk about portfolio. I know this talk has gone long, but hey, since it's on video, it can be, can be longer. <laughs> so portfolio capstone. First of all, what is the book? Just to clarify, if I use that term, this comes from one of their lectures. It could be your online portfolio, a digital portfolio, a bound book, an archive box with your work, traditional back play, back, black case with sleeves, handmade container, whatever. It's all your book. It's really about the contents within it. So uh, here's one of those challenges. Before 2019, it was a tangible portfolio. Finally, finally in 2019, finally I caught up with the 21st century and it's a digital book. So something that someone brings in on an iPad or even an iPhone, or they could put it on their computer. And a little clamshell box, we'll talk about that with some things to touch. Uh, spring 2020, the world went crazy. There were plans and then it was just a digital book. So 2021, I'll explain it. Digital book in a box, sorta. Um, so I'll explain that. So this is pretty much what they're gonna come up with. You know, It's built to a certain size and you can see the specs on my website when we're done, that it can be easily viewed on, on a computer screen, but it can be viewed uh, easily onto you know, a sliding thing on a tablet or even on a phone. It works on a phone too. As you can see that they will build, they will, part of their end projects is also to make captions. So it always goes, if a student is not there to explain it um, or design it, then it's, it's there. It's also when they are there to explain it, a little helper to remind them what to say. So they are going to be, when I say large and small, that doesn't mean like this. I mean that there's a small size, it's dependent on Wi-Fi. It's easy to uh, email, downloaded from website, easily obtained while in a location with Wi-Fi. As it says, this is a screenshot from this last page view website here. So there's pictures of it, but a website is meant to be interacted with. So it links out. The final portfolio is one of those large when just in case someone like you're on an airplane not and you don't happen to have free Wi-Fi for some reason. You know, all links to digital interaction, they're still hyperlinked just in case, but just in case that doesn't work, there's a movie of the work being used embedded in the PDF. Um, also creating it, it for, so again, their, their, their website will have a bunch of different, but this is a linear, it's 10 to 12 pieces. I'm gonna tell you about that with captions. That is because in the ideal situation in an interviewer meeting, the student needs to know how to, or the designer needs to know how to control the narrative with a linear read. If it's just here, look at my website while I'll talk, you'll lose them. It has to be a linear read. Now, as far as the clamshell box and, and the challenge people still, after COVID and before, they still want to touch things. So usually it's an 11 by 17 clamshell box, a little bit larger than what's shown there. Um, and for example, in 2021, we actually, we uh, actually, I actually had the, the, the school buy slightly shallower, slightly larger clamshell boxes for students, which was easy when COVID happened. But, um, and uh, anyway, it holds two printed process books. Those are still required even with COVID. They have to get two professionally printed process books. I'll talk about those. And three to four other pieces that are printed perfectly like books or posters. And then a student would also keep copies of resumes and business cards to offer during an interview in person. So in 2021, process books and business cards are still required to be printed. They're gonna get the clamshell box from me. And then while we're going through portfolio pieces, I'll say, hey, oh, well that's printed, great. You should put that in that box. 
to use when we have in-person interviews again. Or I'll say, hey, this would be a great idea to get printed. But not every single piece. Don't have just the digital portfolio and then everything all again in the box. Just every once in a while, like, oh, here's a book. Instead of having to be hyperlinked or, you know, if, if you're in person with the large portfolio, you could be like, here's the book, look at it. You know, that sort of thing. So by the way, portfolio math, that's what I call. I do 10 to 12 pieces, but it's never just one piece. For example, an ad campaign under one big idea would be three print ads, five social media posts, a t-shirt, a mug, a website. That might equal one in portfolio math, maybe one and a half. So, um, and how to show apps, as I mentioned, uh, definitely you can show flat versions, but those are meant to be interacted with. So have a link. And if you don't have that on the big portfolio, you record someone going through it. Same with websites, same with games, because we have, do have some game design classes. Painting sculptures, photos. This is one of the tips. Um, I used to say only put them into graphic design pieces. I still suggest that that's a good idea. But now in, even since, 2019, I finally switched over and realized experimental personal sections, they're encouraged, but be careful that the book isn't all that. Uh, make sure the interview that where people are going, it would still be fitting, that sort of thing. All right. Weekly assessments are how we do this. So, and they begin the first week of class. And uh, let me go a little bit more. So first of all, I for my portfolio classes, remember it's a co-rec. So first everyone is in professional practice, then during the week, they're either in group A or group B. They only meet, need to meet once a week. And in that case, it is more like a traditional independent study, but it's not independent study. I tried that for many, many before I got them to be co-requisites. That was in addition to my teaching load. It was too much independent between me and the, a student and myself. They need to be around other students, not a whole class, it's too much, they won't listen. But in the same group, it's important that students do this in groups. Um, so, but how this is done is every week, the student fills out a weekly assessment, which I'll show you the InDesign form. And uh, they send it to me, I comment on it, send it back. And then when we meet, we go over the comments. I explain them, they ask questions and the whole group sees it. So the whole groups don't see everybody's weekly assessment until we meet. So group A assessments are due on Saturday. I have 48 hours to check it. We meet in person on Monday. Everyone in the group is in there whether it's in Zoom or in person. On group B, and this is about 10 students. On group B, their assessment is due on Monday. I've got about 48 hours to check it. We discuss in person on Wednesday. So this is the weekly assessment. It's an InDesign form every week. And I'm very specific about how to name things because as you'll see there, that's a screenshot from their Google shared folders. Every week they put it in, it's named a certain thing. Every piece has a number, it doesn't need to be, and things aren't repeated. I, was, I could look at something as piece number two on February 27th and I say, yeah, revise that. I don't need to see it again until April, well, probably March 27th. Um, and when I say here, um, it'll say, have I seen this piece before? And they would say, yeah, it was piece number whatever on whatever week that was. Really important to keep things organized. All right. And every week, they most of the time, they don't need to refill it out. They refill it out once, and then when they, they can just copy paste it the next time I see it, except for that, how will you improve your work? It's what they're doing. Now, they might be a little bit overwhelmed the first time they write this. This is going to help them write captions. This is going to help them make a process book. So then they would put in the image of their piece, they pull down however more that they need from the master page in InDesign. And then it all goes, so for example, student with the last name of Morgan, it's their last name, we would put it in their February 8th folder. That's how they title it. You could use Dropbox just as well as Google Drive. Um, when I reply, I do that. It's a PDF reply. I also give them a count, so I will show you that. So with their reply, and I use Goodreader again, it could be something as simple as, yeah, cool, show me. Remember, that's, I also explain it a little bit more when we meet. Uh, and then another week, um, actually it's probably two, two rounds later where they gave me a mark and I was like, yeah, cool, that's a great mark, uh, but show me many different versions of logo type. And so they gave me that. And then they also, then I said, throw it on some visual identity. So they put it on that. And as you can see, I had a little problem with their indenting and margins, but in the same week, they also gave it to me in a mock-up so I could see it, like doing as much as possible to get the hang of that towards the end. Um, and then I would probably need one more round to approve it. Now, as far as if someone's doing, for example, an app on XD, cool, they do a hyperlink view prototype here. And I would say, cool, keep on going. I don't really have any comments yet, but I need to see how to interact with it. 
Now, as far as their count goes, they will have no maybe revise, keep working, or if they don't want to do it, it's fine. It's up to them. They have control of this. They are, they need to keep track of the count. I mean, I always have it. When we get to preliminary count, I can do the count, but they need to keep track. And one of the incentives for that is because if they get to like eight things approved, I'll probably be like, hey, you only need to do like a couple a week now instead of eight to 10 a week, um, which by the way, that was what they require, eight to 10 pieces every week on weekly assessments before this. But I would either say no, like just no, no, no. Mm -mm. or maybe don't work on it now, but we might come back to it preliminary count if you don't have enough work. Revise, keep working or don't do, and then approved. Approved art just means that until I've you've written the captions at the end of the semester, it's not truly approved, but it's approved for now. Um, it says right there, who keeps track of the work? The student does. I want them to, they should. Uh, there is a preliminary uh, check about two thirds of the way through. It's kind of a threat slash encouragement slash reminder. They should have 80% approved by then. All right, process books. I used to not demand this. I used to think it was too studenty. And then I realized, oh no, they need process books. So I only demand two. They do have to be professionally printed. This is to be over a piece that I've been that I have approved. So I need to get started on that pretty soon. Um, they can either do two separate or uh, visually related in a series, or one process book with two two sections, whichever. As far as before they start designing, they need to see they need to research that. Kind of like they did for budgets with the other class. Um, and perfect bind is required, not saddle stitch. There's lots of samples, including students from last year. And I give them required steps. You know, it's pretty much four steps to any design process, an introduction and a conclusion. Uh, cover page, table of contents. Here's the challenge, and I don't have a solution. I can't check work on top of everything else due in these classes. It's also their capstone class. They should know how to do this by now. There's plenty of apps out there to help with spelling and grammar. I cannot check them. Can't do it after they graduate. They should learn how to do it now. So I assign it, they turn it in. I may or may not have time to check even the first one. I really don't have time to check the second if they can get it out in time to get it printed and back in time. So there's that. That is a challenge I haven't solved. The good news is, Students, they usually do pretty darn well, especially if I have time to check the first one because then they, they get the hang of it. But uh, it's a lot. I will warn you, it's a lot, but it has to be done. All right, and final work and review. We've got both of them going together now. Um, got the, uh, their brand book. There's an example of their table of contents. They've got their, their portfolio and that sort of thing. So I'm going to show you some samples. Actually, the uh, samples that I can show you, I'm just because we don't have a lot of time and I've already talked over my limit. I suggest you go to the brandedshow.com. I'm going to show you that in just a second and go out to their, how their, um, their portfolios work. It's, it's really great. I might try to show you at the end of this talk. Um, but you'll, it's important you see how they work. All right, so the final, just to come back to this, and the, the, the website I'll show you at the end of the talk again. Um, before 2019, portfolio was independent study only, every semester like a traditional class, taught on top of my normal load. They didn't, students didn't talk to each other. Did, I mean, they were in vacuums just talking to me, and they weren't even talking. I was just writing those good reader marks. It wasn't enough, it wasn't. So you have got to push that these because that it becomes its own class. Uh, minor co-requisites because they have to be. I can only teach it once a, once a year. I have to teach other classes the other semester, but really, really put them in little groups. Um, also the branded show, which was a huge thing for professional practice. It couldn't be an actual senior show because some students hadn't taken portfolio yet. It was confusing to attendance. So that's what had to happen. And then finally, finally in spring 2019, and we also had a portfolio review. I'm the, co I'm the education director for AIGA Memphis for the region. And we had this amazing portfolio review and we had the graphic design senior show. It was amazing. So we had the portfolio review. We had and students got to talk to a ton of people. 
we had the senior show. It was amazing. Students and students showed up with a ton of stuff printed. It was wonderful. Then 2020 happened and COVID. Ah. So the good part about it was that we put a lot more work on online. We always had brandedshow.com, but we put all the work online, which is what I'll give that, that link to you. The university did a much better job of pushing it because it's all students had. So in 2021, we are still not going to have a show in person. We are still, I know there are portfolio reviews online. Students are just worn out. I've participated in some of them. They're just, they're just worn out. So we are going to do the interview, their final on Zoom, the week of finals. Fewer printed pieces, but they are shown virtually. So in the future, actually, the interview on Zoom, because it was a challenge with portfolio review, this, the professors didn't actually get to interview them. So maybe we'll have all that we had in spring 2019 and a Zoom interview or interview in person again. Um, but brandedshow.com, definitely look over there. Each of those, you pull them out and we've got, uh, you'll see all of the information, for example, for him. We've got the, the portfolio there um, and everything else, job and journal. We don't do leave behinds anymore, but all of that stuff. I mean, it was all, it's all there to be seen now. All right, and I just mentioned what we would do in the future. So that's the end of a very, very long talk. Whoo, goodness. Um, uh, so just so you know, uh, and almost everything is up for the semester. And if not, you can contact me and get any other information. But uh, so nickyarnell.net.com is my personal site. And definitely go to 4503 and 4803. Those are the two classes and you can see all sorts of stuff there. And that's a little bit more about me. So brandedshow.com, that's my students work. nickyarnell.net is my coursework. Dot com personal, you can contact me there at that email. Uh, and those are my uh, socials. So I think that that is it. And I'm going to try to get out of here and stop my share. And here I am. So thank you very much for listening to all that. I know that went longer than 20 minutes. I would have been pushed right off the stage. Um, I wish you all the best during these strange times. And again, contact me. Um, for any more information on this and I wish you luck.